black girl nerds. Better shake your booties for black girl nerds. Well, I thank you, gentlemen, for your time. I am, as you see, I represent, I live in Inglewood, just in the shadow of the form. So this series was very, very meaningful to me to live through us and then see all these nuances that, you know, weren't available to me as, as a young kid being a Laker fan. Beginning with you, Quincy, I loved your portrayal of, of Irvin Johnson because it's a, it's a very tricky road when not only are you high performing and talented, but you're almost like the favorite child of the franchise. You're the preferred child. And he seemed to have a fine line that he had to navigate with pleasing that side and being a team member. When mm. you think of him and how he was able to kind of tread that line, what impressed you the most learning things about him? And what in that learning did you want to bring to your portrayal? Yeah, um, I think just... Um, making sure that that confidence, you know, and um, even if it wasn't all the way there, that false confidence, it, it allows you to grow it into a real confidence. And I think um, me as an actor, I brought that to set, you know, like, of course, there's a, a feeling of like, can I, am I good enough or can I do this or am I the right person? But like being confident in the work and being confident in who you are and that, who you are before this can stand the test of like what you're being asked to do. And I think that was the same with the character, just coming into a space, not, you know, like feeling sure of yourself, but then having moments where you second guess yourself and you like, even if I do second guess myself, I can't, I can't show it necessarily. Or if I do show it, show it, own it, but we're going to keep going no matter what and and just do the best that you can because at the end of the day, we are trying to figure it out, you know? And it's just um, about owning that and being authentic in that, you know? Mm -hmm. John, for you, your portrayal of Dr. Bus was just, you know, I'm going to give you your little Emmy flowers right now, you know, because I just enjoyed, just you put your whole soul I felt like into the portrayal and I thought about this whirlwind that Dr. Buss was but he always managed to find the win and by buying the Lakers it almost seemed like it gave him a, a little bit more purpose and direction in his life and what he was trying to build and accomplish what did you in the course of your learning what did what surprised you most about Dr. Buss and his ability to kind of corral all of these things in the universe on his side and create what we now know to be this story team that continues to be um, the premier team of the league, no matter what they do. Well, first of all, thanks for the nice things that you said about my performance. I, I did put my whole soul into it. I brought everything I had to this role um, and it took everything I had to do it. Um, you, you've probably seen the first five episodes, but in the second half of the series, it gets very emotional for my character and it was very intense. And I, I lived through some of my own personal experiences again by way of this character. Um, <clears throat> I was delighted to find out that, you know, even though I was thrust into this role seven days before we started shooting the pilot. Um, so I didn't have a lot of time to prepare. I was delighted to learn how much I had in common with Dr. Jerry Buss in terms of his attitude about life. Um, his, his belief in people, like, I think one of his great secrets, or one of his superpowers was trust. He actually, he would give people um, positions of power, whether it was a 19 year old Paula Abdul as the choreographer of the first Laker girls, or whether it was this 20 year old kid from Michigan who he was gonna, you know, give the entire, you know, spotlight of the team to or whether it was the women in his office like Claire Rothman or his daughter, G, who he believed in and he gave opportunities to that a lot of places weren't giving to women at the time. So, you know, a lot of fuss has been made about his personal life and his the, the hedonistic things that everyone was into in the 70s and 80s in LA. But the truth is um, he was a really ethical guy in his own way, you know? He was also someone who, who, who believed in the power of positive thinking, you know? 
And that's something I really share with him. And at a time, you know, just to touch on some of the racial stuff, at the time, you know, practically speaking, a lot of owners were behaving in racist ways. And Jerry, I think, just looked at that and thought, who cares what color the players are? Like, I just want great people, you know? And so he said, you know, you can have Larry Bird. I want that kid that makes me feel good when I watch him play. Um, and, you know, that's not to be underestimated uh, at that moment in the racial politics of America, that someone in a position of power like, like he was um, had that attitude, I think, helped birth a whole new generation of players and a whole new appreciation for the game that, that didn't exist when it was just a, uh, an athletic event, you know, before Jerry made it like this showbiz thing. Absolutely. I could talk to you guys for hours, but they are giving me my time. Thank you guys. You are wonderful. It is a wonderful series. I enjoyed both of your performances so much. And uh, thank you for talking to me. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Take care. Thank you, ladies. It is an honor to Miss Field, an honor. I admire you for so long. Hadley, I am a new admirer of yours and I have I loved your work in, in the series. Uh, beginning, be, beginning with you, Sally, my colleagues and I, because I also cover sports, have these discussions all the time about how difficult it is for women to work in the sports space. And oftentimes they are the machine that keeps the engine going unbeknownst to people who see the car going down the highway. Sally, when you look at, at um, Sally, when you look at Mrs. Buss, and not only did she provide financial financial support, but sage advice. And what what would you say best categorizes the relationship she had with Jerry and this pursuit he had to find, you know, the the desire to grow this dynasty that we all <laughs> come to know and love even now. Yes, even now. Um, well, they have a very interesting relationship. She was his, uh, his primary parental figure. She raised him uh, almost a single parent most of the time, even though she had two sort of bad marriages. Um, and they had basically nothing. And she brought him to Hollywood. She wanted to be a, a, a movie star, but that wasn't gonna happen. That was in the thirties. And so she went to night school and became an accountant. So when he started his business career, she was his accountant in his, company um, starting from nothing because they didn't she didn't come from any money at all um, and he she stayed with it helping him and helping him and then right before he got the Lakers he bumped her out because then he wanted to get you know more professional accountants and she's still pissed off about that but he still relies on her to give him advice do you see anything wrong will you look at the books will you look at the uh, tax returns and um and she does um which you see in this and at one point as she begins to be diminished she she makes a grievous error but she is his she is his a support system is sort of the wrong word because they combat with each other. She's sort of, she's the only one that really tears him down. Um, but she tears him down so she can build it back up again. Uh, and, and the, you, you had to see somewhere in Jerry, the, um, you had to see what Jesse, his mother, how she illuminated somewhere in him. And we worked to, to do that in both how she looked and how they related to each other. For 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 you, Hadley, I'm a huge admirer of Jenny Buss, even now in the things that she's done to really revolutionize the Lakers and modernize them in a way that they never could before. In the process of your learning, when we meet, when we meet you, as Jenny, she's very young. Um, she's got a peachy folder full of all these marvelous ideas. And when you think of yourself and, and you're wanting more and wanting to get your ideas across professionally, personally, what do you think you have in common with her that allowed you to draw upon this, this woman who is brilliant and was able to really revolutionize this company? I mean, I think we have more in common that I'm willing to admit, but I, you know, I was showing up to this project surrounded by a lot of greats, you know, and I think, 
you know, it was a first for me. And I think Jeannie is showing up to the workplace. You know, this is her first time as well. Also, you know, surrounded by greats. And, and there's a certain amount of pressure. And I think what Jeannie does really well is she will learn to thrive under pressure because she doesn't just have a father who is everything that he is. And, um, and the, the pressure doesn't just come from him alone, but also having Claire as a boss and being a woman in the workplace. And, you know, yeah, we have a lot in common. I think Jeannie, that, that folder goes to show just how much work and preparation she puts in. It's a representation of everything she has to do to get to where she wants to be. Um, so at any moment, if something comes up, she's ready with an idea. It, you know, she's waiting for that space to to just speak, to interject, and so she can present these ideas. And and I I you know feel the same way. I think you know Sally and I talk about this, but just doing that level of work so you can show up in that prepared kind of way because there's no room really for failure. Not at all, especially for women. We always have to work a little bit, always a little bit harder, a little bit more prepared. Um, uh, lastly, Sally, for all his flaws, he did have a, a more modern way of thinking in that women were placed in these pivotal roles and he had this trust factor. For him. What do you think that he knew that other people couldn't figure out at that time? Well, like I said, we we were trying to take it off of who he was as a man had to be somehow reflected in his basic, his one parental figure. And so how he looks at women is represented in both places in, in Jesse. He, he leans on them. He relies on them. He hires them, but he puts them down all the time. You know, he, mm. he, he will, uh, he won't recognize them. He won't, and he, and by the women that he, is attracted to he he is very conflicted uh, about how he sees women whether he loves them or hates them he's just not really sure whether he has any regard for them or he desperately needs them around him all the time so that's what you see in Jerry um, we know there are a lot of men like that who need to need their expertise need their skill and their focus. Uh, that they bring in, but really doesn't want to give them any credit for it. Um, and, 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 and they makes them have to work 50 times as hard. And, uh, and then is kind of disrespectful by, by how he treats the women he's dating or what? I mean, so his mother is always calling him up on that, insulting him on that. Who are you with now? You know, Just, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, so we worked hard to have that make sense of how, you know, you add these ingredients up and it ends up and there he is. Well, I thank you ladies. This is a marvelous series. I appreciate your time very much. And thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. It is such an honor. I am a fine Inglewood resident that still lives by the form. So this was a very, very meaningful series. And I loved all of your contributions to it. Uh, beginning with you, Devon, it's an interesting thing when you have to to face your 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 own mortality, your age, and new people coming in, and they want to take you off of your square. When you look at your portrayal of Norm Nixon and how he or and how he had to adjust with with Magic coming to join the Lakers, what do you think that dynamic was? When you look at someone trying to come in and take your square, and how did that inform how you wanted to portray him on the screen? Well, uh, me, I'm, I'm inherently competitive. So, um, you know, I took that in my dad as well. Um, so, I mean, it was easy to, you know, feel that. Um, for example, the one scene that me and Quincy shot where I play him one-on-one, -on -one, um, that was my way of hazing him. Um, you know, like I'm, I'm the head of the fraternity. So you better prove what you can do out on this floor. I'm not just going to give it to you. There's no handouts here because I had been on the team before. But at the same time as well, you know, he respected Magic. I mean, he knew he won the state championship. He knew that he was an incredible uh, phenom. So um, it was just more about, you know, not necessarily um, uh, a competition between the two. It was how are we going to work together? And you got to prove yourself, man. You, this is the NBA, I say. This ain't, no, this ain't no Larry Bird defense. So that's one of my <laughs> lines. So I just want them to um, – you know, come with it, you know, uh, there's no handouts here. So 
you know, prove yourself that you're at the NBA level, sir. (laughs) I love that scene. Solomon, over to you. That scene tickled me so much with the little boy on the set because I have a similar story about Kareem walking around Westwood as a child. And I also asked him for an autograph and had a similar kind of childhood thing. So he scared me as a kid. I love my Lakers, but he scared me. Is mm-hmm. it when you when you look at the, the mind of a genius like Kareem and how he played the game, what do you think? Usually it's, it's a team sport and you have to go along and you have to have these personalities, but he just didn't care. So when you think about him and bringing that type of personality into a team sport, what are your own personal thoughts on having that type of personality? And where did you look within to bring that portrayal to life? Sure. You know, I, so obviously the advantage I, I had was I, I have played on sports teams before and, and I, and I feel like, you know, every competitor goes through seasons where they might feel differently about their role or just the just the the uh, uh or them as an individual right and so i think you know i think what i love about the show is it shows like the fullness of the the experience of these these individuals during this season and so there's a uh, you know there's there's a resistance to the new that i think we all uh face in our lives when we you know when when, when something changes up whether it's a new boss or a new co-worker etc there's there's i think that it's it, it's normal and natural to have a little bit of a resistance to that and so it's really beautiful to see the arc of just how these very different styles and these different perspectives come together to accomplish something as a whole jason for you i was just mesmerized you by you playing Jerry West and someone who's so renowned. I mean, it's the logo, he's historical in NBA history, but knowing your own limitations when it comes to going up the next rung of the ladder. And it's a, it's a sad thing, it's a hurtful thing, but it's a very brave thing to recognize that. What do you think that Jerry was t- tapped into within himself to recognize that despite being a highly competitive, evolved person, and how did that inspire your portrayal? I love those challenges as an actor and even as a person. And you, you know, I don't know how you feel, Jennifer, but as you get older, you're forced to confront certain things. And you can either make change or change will change you. You know, time stands still for no, for nobody. And I love the juncture where this starts for Jerry, and he is you know, run into a brick wall with, with how to, to live, essentially live without, you know, who he was without, with his persona of who people think he is as this, you know, as the logo as as Jerry West, you know, with trying to find, you know, happiness and be a good father even. And then his relationship to, to the game and how it's changing and, and, and who these players are. And, um, and Jerry has to accept that. To become the Jerry that he is now, you see him, you know, talking and choking up when he talks about Elgin and and Chick Hearn and different things and Kobe particularly. You know that, you know he's 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 on his way to becoming, you know, a better man. You know, and and a and a, and a complete human being. That I think the competitiveness and the the rare air of these athletes doesn't allow you to be. You know. You're not having time to round out everything in your life. I watched Minority of One the other night, you know, the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar one that I've been talking about. And it's when he apologizes to his kids at the farewell, you know, I wasn't always there for you because I was here on this court, you know, thing. And so they're forced to make big compromises and big sacrifices without the acknowledgement of it. I mean, I'm sure devon has been through it as well. I can see you nodding there, mate. You know, it's, it's, it's a very particular thing. And I, and I think I love the way this show honestly deals with it. And Jerry's, Jerry's been open about this in his own book, you know, as a sporting superstar and an icon in trying to address, I don't want to say mental issues, like, you know, the, 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 the going on, but just like the ongoing question of, of evolving as we live. We're all pieces of work in action, you know, and that's a given in life. And uh, I love, you know, like I said, I, you know, I love that this show demonstrates that and, and Jerry allows us to see it. Mm-hmm. Well, gentlemen, I have thoroughly enjoyed the episodes that I've seen. I can't wait to see the rest of them. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Love your shirt there too. Thank you. Kobe. Oh, cool. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time. I appreciate it. I had to represent. Yeah. I live here. 
I'm living in Inglewood. I live in the shadow of the form. So I was just yeah. too excited to see all of your marvelous performances in this series. And you did not disappoint. Jason, beginning with you, Paul Westhead, when we think of the Lakers history and the, and the lineage and the, the championships, I feel like Paul goes under the radar in, in, in the part that he played in that. Uh, when you were doing your research and preparing to portray him, what were your own thoughts on his leadership style? And did you find that anything in his ability to lead mirrored anything in your own personal life and how you lead and how you conduct, you know, winning and in your approach to success? It's a really great question. Uh, yes, I think Paul Westhead is uh, a, definitely a lesser known figure in this franchise. And um, part of what they presented to me was this crazy story of this uh palace intrigue in the coaching staff of year one, where uh, there's betrayal and there's loyalty. And uh, Paul Westhead in particular is a Shakespearean scholar. And I think he sees it all that way. And it's the story of a, of a guy who views himself as second place being forced to become the leader of men. Um, and yeah, I did find parallels in my own life. I think that when you're young, there is something really uh, endearing about an underdog mentality. Mm. And as you grow older and more successful, you kind of want to hold on to that underdog mentality because it's what got you where you are and uh, it feels humble. But when you are older and successful, you know, you start to realize, oh, this isn't really genuine anymore. I have to own that I am actually good at this and, and that's okay. And that's not arrogant. And I think there is some of that for Paul Westhead is learning to step into his own manhood and not apologize for being a leader. I'm going to snip that and make that into a social clip because there's a lot of discussions now about people with imposter syndrome and, and, you know, owning your greatness and Adrian, the, quite the opposite with Pat. I don't think Pat ever really lacked for any confidence. He just wanted, wanted to be. And, when people think of Pat and the slick back hair and all the championships and Jack Nicholson at the at ringside, we see that. But underneath the surface, there are vulnerabilities happening. There's a, the dynamics in his household of, of breadwinning and just all these things that are happening behind the scenes of the Pat Riley that we come to know. What was most fascinating about him as a man to you as you set forth and bringing him and embodying him on the screen? Well, just as you said, you know, those observations were were my own as well in, in this discovery. And, and Pat Riley, uh, I've always looked up to him. I've always seen him even from my youth and witnessed somebody with, who carried himself with with great confidence and, and control and and um, understanding of the game. And, and, uh, and he was a leader. And you know, I learned so much about this time that preceded that. And uh, I think it's very um, revealing to see uh, how someone who's achieved that can, has to struggle to, to find that essentially. And, um, you know, it's a, uh, it's a moment. It's a moment in his life, and he's had he's had many moments. He, he, you know, he was a he had a he had a big success as a as a ball player. You know, he 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 already spent a lifetime giving it to the game, and here he was really trying to find um, a way in. And um, I like how that arc will will really show such a a journey for a man and. Um, I, it was a lot of that was news to me. You know, I didn't really know all of those aspects about his life and, and I'm still learning about him. I'm, I'm constantly trying to, to find details and, and study his writings, which are really informative. Um, and, uh, you know, he's, he's an inspiration. It was a sad day here in LA when he left the Lakers. Yeah. Lastly. And New York Jason, for that matter. <laughs> and, New York too. And then in Miami too, you know, he, he revolutionized, you know, just coaching and just his approach to the game. 
So Jason, one last question. If we had to go outside and play horse right now, you and Adrian, who's winning horse right now? Who's the better shooter? I'll give it to Jason. I'm not even going to get into that right now. I mean, first of all, the guy towers, towers uh, <laughs> over, over most men. Um, and he's, he's, a, he's a ball player, you know? I'm really good at most Cali, things. He's a Cali kid who grew up playing ball. So I'm an actor. I'm just merely an actor, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thank you, gentlemen. They are giving me the hook. I appreciate you. This is a marvelous series. Thank you so much for your thank time you. and your thank talents. You it was fun. just wonderful. Thank you. Appreciate oh, you. Thank awesome. you. Thanks. Thank you, Michael for your time and your performance. This is a marvelous, a marvelous series that's exposing us as the audience to, to things we never knew. Uh, when I watched you and your portrayal as Red and thinking about alpha males and what it means to win and that commitment to it, I think that's what he had figured out that winning is one thing, but it's what happens after the winning that keeps you in that zone. When you think of your own ideas of success in your career or whatever success means to you personally, what do you think in your own personal ideas you have in common with Red? Well, just a work ethic. And um, I, like, I remember, you know, it's funny that you asked me this question. I was talking to my children about this the other day. When I, the, the, the day after, I'm just, I guess I fear complacency because I think that as soon as you start to believe in your own hype or, uh, or start to, you know, uh, you get lazy, you get complacent and, and you, your, your work starts to spiral down. So you have to have this commitment to continually learn and grow and get better. And that's, that's the work ethic of a champion. I mean, when you talk about, um, the Kobe's or the magics or the uh, Michael Jordan's of the world or any of these guys, they, all every one of them all you hear about is their legendary workouts their incredible just maniacal uh drive towards continuing to better themselves and to continue to win as opposed to one and done mm. you know it's one thing to to rise to fame or, or or to success and hit a certain pinnacle and then just go ah, i'm the greatest and whatever and then you just spiral out of it but if you're if you're if you're driven, you have this sort of marathon long view of it, where you have to just keep going. And I think that, you know, Red definitely had that. Mm -hmm. For for the younger generation of basketball fans, they won't know all the, the this historical background, you know, maybe they're more Kobe, LeBron, Shaq error type fans but you look at the foundations of some of the greatest basketball played it began the conversations begin with magic and with larry bird and that era out of the out of the 90s what, what was your thoughts on the 90s were you a huge basketball fan during that era and what was the the things you remember most about that time well it goes back to the 80s this is this is the showtime lakers which is the 80s it started in 79 mm -hmm. And I, I was at Boston University from 1981 to 1985. So I bore witness to this thing mushrooming where, you know, here you had uh, the Boston Celtics uh, and, and Red Auerbach who represented the orthodoxy or the, or the establishment, the East Coast establishment of basketball, if you will. And here comes Jerry Buss, who's like the interloper, the hey there, hi there, ho oh there, flashy Los Angeles guy who brilliantly saw the the sort of an opportunity to fuse entertainment with uh uh with sport in a way that it wasn't be uh, the influence of the showtime lakers through all out all sports is undeniable because of his vision and it only i guess could come from an outsider so, see mm. i think that guys like red were so preoccupied with the actual fundamentals of the sport and winning the game and the nuts and bolts and the orthodoxy of the sport that they they in terms of big picture they weren't thinking of thinking of marketing and asses and seats you know this is a guy like jerry buss 
saw this and said, hey, man, this is fun. I love basketball. We should make this fun and sexy. And I don't think it could have happened in any other time than 1979, 80, 81, because it was just a different time, right? I mean, there was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It was a very loose time. Um, and I, I think that, that you couldn't have the same kind of progression as you have now. We were just natural rivals, different philosophies entirely. And the competition was so fierce. Now you the, the players are, are protected a lot in a way, which is good and it should be, but at the time they weren't. And these guys went to war. It was it was just, you know, anybody who loves sport and loves rivalry, you were knew you were watching something incredibly special throughout the '80s, and then obviously into the '90s and beyond. But it really, again, this kind of rivalry started in the '80s with the Showtime Lakers and the Celtics. Absolutely. Well, I thank you, sir. I could talk free to you for a long time, but that is my Same. time. Your wonderful, wonderful portrayal. Thank you for your thank time. You. I really, really enjoyed the episodes I've seen. Thank you so much. I see you with that Lakers jersey. You, I, live <laughs> in Ingl- I, I, I live in Inglewood. The form's right there. I got you. I got you. I'm here in LA too, but go Celtics. <laughs> oh, boo. Thank you. <laughs> I'll see you. Better shake your booties for black girl nerds. Better shake your booties for black girl nerds.